Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Collecting Applying Bike Data, Current and Future Trends, presented in partnership between EcoCounter and the League of American Bicyclists. Uh, before we begin, I just want to say how excited we are for today's lineup of speakers and also for such a great number of attendees. We've had a lot of people register and that's just great. So we're really excited to get started, but um, just before we begin, I want to give just a brief introduction. Uh, my name is Andrea Shalolo. I'm a client consultant with EcoCounter and I'm going to be hosting today's event. For those of you who don't know, EcoCounter is a world leader in providing automated cyclist and pedestrian counting systems. We've been providing communities with the tools necessary to collect and communicate cyclist and pedestrian data for over 15 years. In addition to providing the technology to count bikes, we're also really interested in encouraging data-driven approaches to planning and in working with partners to find better tools to collect and to communicate data. That's actually how we began working with the League of American Bicyclists and their Bike Friendly Communities program. So just a bit of a background there. Uh, the League of American Bicyclists is a member organization that promotes cycling throughout the United States through work such as advocacy and education. Its bicycle friendly community program provides clear step by step guidelines to help communities become more bicycle friendly. So EcoCounter is not only a proud sponsor of this program, we also benefit greatly from being part of it by keeping an ear to the ground on communities' needs when it comes to bike data. Um, I won't go into too much detail here because two of our speakers today are actually going to talk about that work. But these themes of collaboration and data-driven approaches to bike planning are consistent with the themes of today's webinar. Uh, we know that data plays an increasingly important role in how we plan our cities, and bike data is no exception. But what are the best practices in data collection, and how can data be meaningfully used once we have it? So for today's talk, we brought together a lineup of both planning practitioners and cycling advocates to share their insights on these topics, uh, backed up by some really impressive case studies from both state and local levels. So joining us today, oh, let's we'll see if I can advance here, are Michael Pettish, Bicycle and Pedestrian Data Coordinator with MinDOT, Becca Wolfson, Executive Director from the Boston Cyclist Union, David Patton, Bicycle and Pedestrian Planner from the Arlington County Division of Transportation, our very own Matt Ainsley, Market Strategist with EcoCounter, and Amelia Neptune, uh, Director with the Bicycle Friendly America program at the League of American Bicyclists. So we're really excited, as I said, about today's lineup of speakers and the diverse perspectives that they bring to the table. And I'm sure that our audience is pretty excited about that too. So we've set aside some time for questions um, just to make sure that the speakers get adequate time to speak. We're going to respond to questions at the end of today's session. Um, but you can type your questions in at any time during the call. Amelia is actually going to moderate this Q&A, and I'm sure she'll do her best to get to as many questions as she can. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Michael Pettish. Uh, Michael works for MnDOT, or the Minnesota Department of Transportation, uh, managing and coordinating its bicycle and pedestrian data collection. With, back, with a background in environmental and in, sorry, with a background in environment and transportation, he works with stakeholders across Minnesota to make biking a safe, efficient, and enjoyable mode of transportation. Uh, here at EcoCounter, we're really proud to work with Michael. Uh, a major highlight has been his counter loan program, where he shares data with community partners. Uh, thanks to him, a huge variety of organizations now have access to count data, and we think that's really, really cool. So to tell you more about his work, I'm going to hand it over to Michael. Fantastic, thank you for the introduction, Andrea, and thank you for the invitation as well, Matt, I appreciate it. Hello all, uh, thank you for tuning in and listening. I, um, I'm going to give a large, very varied overview of what we've been doing in Minnesota 
And if you happen to attend the APBP conference in Portland recently, uh, this will kind of be a rapid fire version of the presentation that I gave. So I'm looking forward to any questions that you have uh, and hope I can answer them at the end of this. So again, I'm the pedestrian and bicyclist data coordinator, so not the coordinator for the state. We have a different person, Amber Dahlman, that is that, but I am specifically trying to coordinate the data related to biking and walking in Minnesota with, as Andrea mentioned, lots of different partners all over the state. So um, yeah, I titled it Walking and Rolling Data uh, Melodies in Minnesota, and I think that'll be the only musical reference that I make in this presentation, but just talking about stories that uh, we're able to tell. Next slide, please. So going over several different topics, the pedestrian and bicyclist data program that Andrea had mentioned, as well as some economic and health impact studies and data that we have collected over the past uh, few years, some safe routes to school information and what we've been doing um, in a fairly innovative way with regards to that program, and then innovation stations. So that's kind of a, a catch-all for lots of things that are in the works. So starting with the pedestrian bicycle data program, so it's not just the collection of the data, it's also trying to figure out how to use it. And so at MnDOT, we have essentially two separate programs. One that is a uh, consists of several permanent counters that are affixed in the ground uh, all over the state. And then also, as Andrea had mentioned, we have a portable loaning program um, and just some examples of the locations that we have installed in the past. Next slide. So the permanent sites, we are, um, over the past, I guess, five years, we've installed, almost six years now, we've installed 22, or sorry, 29 counters at 22 locations all over the state. They cover all climatic zones, they cover um, lots of different facilities, including 13 trail facilities and nine that are on road. The, um, the numbers are, uh, high, the number of locations is lower than the number of counters because some locations have multiple counters, one that's counting one direction of traffic and one that's counting the other direction at the same site. Uh, the initial location ch uh, choosing was a very joint effort. So MnDOT essentially <clears throat> with research dollars purchased the counting equipment and then worked with local partners, uh, state uh, department of natural resources, Department of Health, uh, regional development commissions, cities, counties, to try and identify locations within their jurisdictions that, um, and some within MnDOT's too, where we knew people were biking and walking. So we wanted to initially collect at sites where we knew people were. And we will be expanding this program and the number of locations in a more strategic manner in the future. Uh, but that initially, with research dollars and funding, that's that was the approach that we took. MnDOT is in uh, in charge of releasing uh, papers and reports, annual reports of how the data is, what the data is saying, and then also uh, developing factoring methods to expand short duration counts and to. Uh, estimate for entire years. <clears throat> Lots of different partnerships have been involved within this program. Next. Um, so, I don't know if it's just my screen, but it might be others. The, there's a little bit of the slides that are being cut off, but essentially the portable loaning program, it consists of two counters that are in a equipment kit and we have eight of those around the state. So we have an infrared sensor and a tube counter, both from EcoCounter in each kit, and they are spread across our eight MnDOT districts. <clears throat> they are free to use by local partners and entities, and essentially they just check it out like they would a library book and then return it when they're done. Um, 
it's the the coordination of the checkout and return is coordinated locally with within our districts. It provides a wide coverage uh, for other um, data across the state. So we have all of those uh, 22 permanent sites, but then this this program uh, gives us a wider geographic coverage of data collection, and then it's all public data. And you can see over the past, uh, I haven't included 2019, and uh, there I think are a couple sites in 2018 that are missing, but essentially there's been widespread interest and participation across the state, and um, the the cities are just the locations in which the the counts were taken. It's been multiple partners aside from individual cities. So uh, DNR, Parks and Trails Council, local public health, Safe Routes of School, um, coordinators and other things. So it's been uh, widely used. Next. And some of the data that we have collected has been used for a variety of reasons. So the upper left-hand corner, it's a photo collage taken from a bunch of different um, screenshots of video that was collected over 11 or 20 days. And it's essentially just showing all the, the different types of people wa walking and biking across one of our highways in north central Minnesota and trying to better understand how people are using the facility, how where they're trying to go from housing to work, to, to grocery store, to movie theater, or gas station, whatever else, and how they're getting around and trying to address the concerns that the local communities have and uh, that we at MnDOT have not appropriately addressed in the past. Uh, the data is also used for maintenance all year round, sweeping, maintaining um, safe and accessible and usable facilities across the state, including in the winter. And, and then city of um, Mankato was actually uh, the local public health there, heard about a project, a resurfacing project and collected some data and sent it to or presented it to the city and got three mid-block crossings in it and then it's also used for uh, counting uh, lots of different recreational things uh, such as fat bike use on trails in the winter next so in addition to collecting i'm also heading the statewide pedestrian bicyclist data task force it combines a lot of different partners from state, county, uh, state agency. We even have um, someone that's sitting on the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration that used to work within Minnesota and is uh, following along with our interests. But it's essentially just combining a bunch of different players in this area together to collectively try and address data needs and um, how we can collectively work together to Im improve upon each other and not just um, uh, in trying to limit the duplication of efforts. Next. And this task force actually developed a pretty strong uh, and united vision, mission, uh, goals, strategies that we were all interested in, in pursuing and want to uh, collectively work towards. And along came some additional funding, and so we hired Alta, who will be um, finalizing the strategic plan for this program that I've somewhat been reactionarily maintaining and running for the past five years. So the strategic plan is taking into account a lot of the awesome information that the task force helped develop and will be out later this month. Next. Some economic and health impacts of bicycling in Minnesota. So in 2016, there was a research project done between lots of different uh, state and local partners. And some findings uh, point to bicycle commuting prevents uh, a, a lot of deaths per year. And then it actually is three times um, bike commuting per week is linked to uh, large declines and a lot of different health issues. 
and in as a result, it's actually saving Minnesota and our taxpayers um, and insurance companies as well, 100 to $500 million a year. Next. Economic benefits. Bicycling brings in a lot of dollars to the state in terms of economic activity and then also related to labor income and jobs. And it's not all from the people that actually are coming uh, for the bicycle specific, um, coming to participate in bicycle events. It's also the people that they are bringing along as well. And so um, about a, a third of the total visitors that traveled to Minnesota for bicycle events um, didn't participate, but it also means that they came along and uh, ate meals and uh, rented um, taxis or bike share or whatever else and slept at hotels. So it's, it's all related dollars that's making a big impact in the state. Next. And then, yeah, additional bicycle industry benefits, supporting lots of different employees. And it, uh, in 2014, over $6 million in economic activity. Next. So Safe Routes to School is a big, um, it's a very successful and uh, well-known program throughout the entire state of Minnesota. And in the past, over the past, well, since its inception, essentially, we've been trying to answer all these questions. So how are we utilizing funding? What does demand look like for Safe Routes of School? Um, what, has, uh, what have other school districts done in the past with regards to it? And so in the past year and a half, if you go to the next slide, we've been working on a state uh, map application, essentially, to bring together all the resources that we know about for Safe Routes of School. So the map itself uh, outlines MnDOT construction districts. Next. And our district engineers are able to look within their districts to see who has a plan and who doesn't. It also incorporates lots of different school districts. Next. <clears throat> lots of uh, SHIP grantees, so it's a lot of jurisdictions. Next. The, we can split it up by Senate and House districts, so we can specifically target legislators next or inform um, them of things that are going on in the area. And this is essentially what it looks like from a macro scale. There's a lot of projects, lots of planning assistance, infrastructure, bicycle fleets, um, but it's all been finally mapped. Next. And um, you can go to the next one too. And the further you zoom in, as with any of these interactive mapping, app mapping applications, you can get a better sense of within the area that you are interested in what has been going on in that area over time. Next. And yeah, that's just drilling down to a specific planning assistance um, program. And then the plan itself is linked to it in that uh, we've had some fantastic uh, interns that have helped us with this and linking all the public documents. Next. And finally, the innovation station. So making sure that we're working for all ages and abilities across all the data and all the uses that we have in Minnesota. And some of the big things that are that we're currently working on are the bicycle design manual, which will be specific from, for Minnesota, but taking in a lot of different uh, awesome information from all over this, the country that's due out in uh, this year. Like I mentioned, the strategic plan for pedestrian and bicycle data program, again, due this year. Minnesota pedestrian plan is coming, um, coming out in 2021, and that is building off of Minnesota Walks, which was a, uh, a, a, a fantastic baseline kind of study. It wasn't exactly a plan, but it brought together a lot of resources and identified priority populations that we've been working with and uh, involving more in our processes. processes. And then uh, the Minnesota State Bicycle Facilities web map. So we have a state bicycle map, and we're working on developing an interactive web, web map. 
um, trying to better automate data checks and reports for the count data that's coming in through our eco counters and um, lots of additional research in terms of walking and biking needs in uh, greater Minnesota and rural communities and tribal communities and continuing scoping walks for major road and bridge projects that are planned and um, have some sort of bicycle and pedestrian component or a ADA component within them. And then uh, it, we're also working on designating our th well, designating and creating our third U.S. bicycle route through the state. We already have two, we're working on a third. And I think the next slide is the end. So thank you. I look forward to your questions at the end. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Michael. Um, I think that's a really uh, impressive project you've got going on, both in terms of geographical area and the number of partners. I think it's really impressive and inspiring. And I hadn't picked up on the walking and rolling pun. Uh, great work. <laughs> so moving on to our next speaker, uh, Becca Wolfson. Uh, Becca has served as an executive director of the Boston Cyclist Uni Union since August 2015, where she works to ensure that everyone can feel safe riding a bike as a means of transportation. Uh, she also sits on many task forces and advisory boards to advance Vision Zero and local infrastructure projects in Boston, Cambridge, and Somerville. While she's not at work, in meetings, or partnering with us at EcoCounter, Becca can be found working towards her master's in urban and environmental policy and planning at Tufts University. So Becca, I'm going to hand it over to you. Great, thank you so much, Andrea. Um, happy to be here today talking about data. Um, as Andrea said, I'm the executive director of the Boston Cyclist Union. Um, if you want to advance the slide. Um, we, oh, next slide. Um, we're an advocacy organization um, trying to transform Greater Boston into a city where everyone is safe and comfortable riding a bike. Um, we organize residents to speak up at public meetings and with regards to projects. We plan public actions um, to hold city and state agencies accountable. Um, we also often partner with city and state agencies to move projects forward. Um, and we plan events to engage people and, and help get them comfortable riding a bike in the first place. Um, next. So I'm going to be sharing um, a case study where of a campaign and how we use data as advocates to win safe bike facility improvements. Um, and a lot of the data that we actually use in this campaign and that we use often in our work is data that city and state agencies collect that we're able to use um, as advocates. So with so many municipal employees on this webinar, I hope that you know, you're know you able to take that to heart and that many of you who are both collecting robust data are also making that accessible. Um, so as an advocacy organization, we love data. Um, it helps demonstrate the truth about ridership. Uh, it makes a case for more infrastructure and helps us make the case for more funding, and it informs and supports our campaigns and policies. So um, the image that you see on the right here, we conducted a study about winter biking two winters ago. Um, often, you know, we find that infrastructure doesn't get the clearance that it needs, and um, in the past, although not so much anymore, um, different agencies, you know, weren't doing the best for clearance because there was a perception that people don't ride in winter. Um, so in this winter biking survey, one of the questions we asked was what's most likely to prevent you from biking in winter? And we got really important data that showed that poor road conditions, lack of safe infrastructure um, were some of those barriers and use that to continue to advocate. Uh, next slide. Also, uh, if any of you live in Boston, you might know the name Jeff Jacoby, uh, who's a Boston Globe columnist who about once a year writes an article, um, an anti-bike article. And the last time that happened, um, some advocates came together and, and wrote a rebuttal piece that the bike lane fever isn't actually breaking. And we were able to use the city of Boston's really robust bike count data um, to demonstrate that even though census data 
showed a decline. Um, the city's data itself showed that uh, year over year, the bike counts were actually growing by about 30%. So again, you know, where we all know that census data has some challenges and limitations, um, city count data programs can be really helpful there. Uh, next. Um, so what I'm really here to talk about is um, a really, a, a case study that we're really proud of for the Longfellow Bridge campaign. So for some background, um, the Longfellow Bridge is an iconic bridge that crosses the Charles River in this, between the city of Boston and the city of Cambridge. Um, back in 2009, the state agency, MassDOT, began a redesign process to figure out uh, what the bridge would look like after some restoration work was done. So there was an opportunity to change the lane allocation and how that was utilized. Um, so the, at the time, there were two travel lanes in each direction, two inbound from Cambridge to Boston and two outbound from Boston to Cambridge. Um, there was about a three foot shoulder, there were no bike lanes, but it was a heavily trafficked route. Um, advocates pushed for a road diet, uh, so our goal at the time in 2009 uh, was for the bridge to get reduced from two lanes to one in each direction and have protected bike lanes. Um, we didn't win everything we were asking for. There was a lane reduction from two lanes to one from Boston to Cambridge um, and a, a wider paint buffered bike lane planned there. Um, but their two lanes were planned um, to remain from Cambridge to Boston in that inbound direction. Um, they were narrowed so that a five-foot painted bike lane was going to be added. Um, so we consider that a, a semi-win. You know, we weren't pleased, um, but that was how the process ended. Um, but then during construction from uh, really 2012 through 2018, of the four lanes on the bridge, only one was opened from Cambridge to Boston. Um, there was nothing in the outbound direction. And as the construction was coming to an end, about eight months before it was supposed to be open, advocates came together and said, you know, during this construction period, there's only been one lane and the world hasn't ended. There hasn't been a traffic apocalypse. Uh, what can we do? to keep it that way and to, to keep just one lane in each direction and get protected bike facilities. And in that time, both Cambridge and Boston had adopted Vision Zero, both had more ambitious goals for mode shift. Um, you know, it's become a climate imperative to get people out of cars and onto bikes. And we know now, and you know, that wasn't as widely accepted in 2009 and, and 2011, um, that, you know, we need to provide safe infrastructure. And, and the city of Cambridge and the city of Boston both agreed, but you know, everyone kind of said, well, this is already set in motion, um, and, and we really do need that capacity for cars. Um, so, uh, next slide. Uh, next slide, great. So, so yeah, so as you can see here, this was the construction condition. So there was one lane um, in one direction to Boston and none on the other. Uh, next slide. And so while the bridge was supposed to open in May of 2018, in November, we as advocates started a campaign. So we tried to get folks to envision what the Longfellow Bridge could look like if uh, it wasn't open back up to two lanes of traffic into Boston and just one was maintained and we could have a really nice wide separated bike lane um, for all the people who bike there. And this was informed by data. So next slide. Uh, so as you can see, as I mentioned, the city of Boston has been doing a really robust uh, bike count program. Um, they count bikes using video technology at 62 locations, do analysis and publish a, I think it's an 80 or so page report. Um, and this shows in, in 2017, um, the circled area is that Longfellow Bridge. It had the fifth highest bike count of any of the 62 locations in the city. Um, we knew that uh, Traffic volumes were actually fairly low, um, and there's an eco-counter eco totem um, in Cambridge leading up to that Longfellow Bridge corridor that showed that bike ridership was only rising. There were about 1,500 daily cyclists, um, and we uh, did some speed data collection. So we used um, a speed radar, um, handheld. Um, 
machine and had volunteers out on the bridge collecting speed data of cars. And we sort of averaged just on a, a two hour period um, that the average speed on the Longfellow Bridge was 35 miles an hour with a max of about 50. And on the Mass Ave Bridge, which is um, the next bridge over parallel to the Longfellow Bridge, the conditions are what the Longfellow was going to go back to. So on the Mass Ave Bridge, you have two lanes in each direction. Um, and with a two lane bridge, the average speed was 45 miles an hour and the max was 70 miles an hour. So we were making the case that if the Longfellow went from one lane to two in the inbound direction, that average speed had the potential to skyrocket up 10 more miles per hour where um, the posted speed was 30, but the state actually agreed to drop it to 25. So we said without the physical conditions changing, um, people's behavior was not going to change. So we had a what we thought was a really strong campaign. Um, next slide. And over about a um, four month period, uh, we worked with the state. So, you know, I'll say the MassDOT was our sort of target to get them to change their minds. And, and we really had a collaborative relationship with them through this campaign. Um, we were meeting with, you know, the advisor to the secretary um, and the highway administrator. They took all this data to heart. They said, you know, we really do care about safety. We are concerned. We understand that things have changed. And they agreed to pilot um, a separated bike lane and it wasn't exactly what we wanted so instead of going from two travel lanes to one they narrowed what were going to be 11 foot lanes to 10 and a half narrowed um, a shoulder on the opposite side by half a foot and made the five foot bike lane six and a half feet and added flex posts um, and agreed to collect some data to see if this was successful um, and and then they would possibly widen the bike lane and and do a reduction from two lanes to one, but that the data collection was going to be paramount. So we said, okay, we're going to work with you to define what data needs to be collected and what's successful. And so we worked with the state and, and got them to say publicly um, that success um, and what they'd be looking for in the data was that this new configuration made the bridge safer for people who bike, it slowered speeds, um, and that also emergency vehicle access was maintained and that traffic queues weren't, uh, you know, traffic didn't, um, wasn't abominable. Um, so next slide. So as you can see here, um, NASA put together a stakeholder group and we met about four times through the um, pilot design process and then afterwards to assess collaboratively. Um, and so you can see the data that they agreed upon was vehicle counts, bicycle counts, pedestrian counts, crash data, speed of vehicles, and then also the regional vehicle impact and emergency vehicle impact. And as advocates, we really push to say, you know, if people have a minute, two minutes, three minutes, even five added to their commute, commutes are already really bad. Um, you know, regional traffic shouldn't be the focus of this. It should really be safety first. So, you know, we emphasize the crash data, speed, and making sure bike counts didn't go down um, and that they continued to rise. And, and that's been an ongoing process. Um, but next slide. Um, so once those flex posts were put in, we then approached winter uh, and had another, what could have been a setback. The state said, we don't think that we can safely clear this bike lane. We're going to remove the flex post per winter. Um, and we really mobilized and, and mobilized the community to say that just isn't going to be acceptable, you know, especially since this was all about safety. Um, and uh, next slide. So we already were able to say um, that the um, anticipated post-construction counts were three times what the actual post-construction counts were. So you can see in this um, circled area, um, the data that uh, was, the, the predicted data uh, was that traffic would be three times more than it would. So we said, you know, we really have to continue to prioritize biking. Uh, next slide. Also, 
NASDAQ shared with all of us in the stakeholder group um, that one third of the vehicles on the bridge were still driving 10 or more miles per hour over the speed limit. So we said for safety, you know, we really have to keep the separation in. Uh, and next slide. And also the eco counter uh, totem in um, a spot that leads straight up to the Longfellow Bridge is a, a data point that we often, uh, a source that we often point to that shows about 40% of the people who bike in the warmer months continue to bike in the winter. So we said, you know, you're not keeping these flex posts in for a fringe issue. This is for a significant portion of the population. Um, they're only about 10 days in the year where the roads are really impassable for biking. Um, so next slide. So as this screenshot of the Globe article shows, um, we were able to get the state to um, keep those flex posts in place um, they were able to find a small piece of snow clearing equipment from the western part of the state and brought that into the city. So sorry, Western Mass, but we um, got a really tiny bobcat um, that was able to um, actually keep that bike lane clear and keep those flex posts in um, for the, you know, hundreds and more than thousand people who bike over that daily. Um, so in conclusion, uh, next slide. Um, so, you know, for all the advocates on the phone, um, and on the webinar, you know, we always, uh, one thing that we had as a takeaway um, was to, you know, continue to question models and predictions and ask what assumptions are made. Again, uh, the state data had assumed that there'd be three times more traffic and vehicles than there were after construction um, to really decide and define um, what data measurements will be useful and, and what success um, is and that year-round counts are really important for a number of reasons. So again, for anyone who does year-round counts, who has an ecototem, um, hopefully you're making that data accessible to folks, and for advocates, hopefully you're um, accessing that data. And next slide. And that is it. Um, thank you. All right, thank you so much, Becca. Um, I think it's really wonderful to have the perspective of a cycling advocacy organization. And those are some really great case studies uh, as to how data can help make real changes on the ground. Those are some great takeaways. I also really like that you highlighted the importance of accessibility of data. I think that's really great. Um, before we move on to our next speaker, I just wanted to mention that we are collecting questions. We have quite a few already. That's excellent. But I just wanted to remind everyone and people who have, may have just tuned in that we're going to be addressing all of those questions at the end in a Q&A session. So moving on, I would like to present our next speaker, David Patton. Uh, David has been committed to bicycle and pedestrian issues for more than 25 years. He manages Arlington's network of 38 continuous automatic bicycle and pedestrian encounters, which is nearing its 10th anniversary, uh, his project there. Uh, EcoCounter has worked with David for many years, and he's considered a minefield of knowledge when it comes to making communities more bicycle friendly. And I will let David Patton tell you more about it. All right, well, hello, everybody. Um, oh, would you please go back one slide just a minute, Andrea? Yeah. Um, I'm calling this developing a second generation uh, bicycle pedestrian counting network because we've been at this for nearly 10 years. We've learned some lessons. We have some age in the system now. Um, and so second generation, we're not starting from scratch. And I wanted to say just a word about my introduction to bicycle counts specifically started when I was in grad school uh, many years ago, and I was working on bicycle history, both in the US and in the UK, and came across a great set of data from London traffic counts in the 1920s and 30s. And these were counts uh, done manually by police officers stationed throughout the city at many, many, many locations, like several hundred locations for the entire daylight hours of a one day a year. They counted horse-drawn vehicles and streetcars and bicycles and motorcycles. It's great, great data and tremendous numbers for bicycle usage in uh, London, which was great for my research at the time. And it just 
primed the pump for me to, to realize how important it was to document the usage on the ground of cycling. And so um, years later, I was the state bicycle pedestrian coordinator in Virginia at VDOT in Richmond and we, you know, advocated then for the importance of collecting data. And it was very much in tune with my uh, peers across the country. And when I wound up working, uh, beginning to work for Arlington in uh, about 10 years ago, we started installing a, a network of counters. So next slide, please. So this is where we are now. The the map says uh, January 2019, but it's actually current as of now. Uh, 38 devices currently. They're almost all eco counter. One is from a company called Metro Count. It's an Australian firm. We have one of their piezo counters. Different technology works really well. Kind of experimental site. A bit like Michael said, we have some sites that have more than one. Uh, counting technology device. We're sort of racing things against each other. Uh, so most of the permanent counters are on our off-road trails. It's one of the things that Arlington is known for. We have a, a great network of off-road uh, trails. Uh, we have 13 that are on bike lanes, uh, and we will soon have all the Potomac River bridge crossings covered. I was out this morning installing loops on what will be the rebuilt Arlington Memorial Bridge, which crosses between the National Mall and Arlington Cemetery. It's a major, major uh, reconstruction project of the National Park Service, and we're gonna have permanent bike and ped counters on both sidewalks. One of the things we've learned is that there are limitations to point count data. Um, and so as, a, as an undertaking, we're moving towards modeling and prediction and projections, and there are, um, research projects going on, and we participate in those. And bearing in mind that you put hardware equipment out in the field, there's a maintenance and operation burden. And so uh, 38 counters is, is a sizable fleet, and uh, it keeps me hopping sometimes to uh, keep things up and running. Next slide, please. We uh, publish our data on a public facing website the the tag is there it's, we call it the uh, the bike count dashboard it's it's regional so it's our counters plus alexandria city in virginia plus dc plus uh, two counties in maryland it's a little bit clunky needs to be upgraded this is part of the 2.0 network we need to uh, clean up freshen up our data display but we're committed to um, making this available we provide um, data for developers so they can pull the information off and use it for building apps. Um, research had a great story a couple of years ago. Researchers in England found this website and they used our uh, count data to do a study for nighttime lighting. They were lighting engineers and they wanted to see was there a way of pulling out of this data, the, the shift in usage that happens around the shift of the time at the daylight savings time. And it was a great study, it got published, we got a little uh, you know, shout out for our help, and it was a, a great surprise. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oop, the back one. There we go. Uh, so one of the things you quickly learn doing bike ped data is that it there's a very, very strong correlation to the weather. Um, the top left uh, snapshot there, the yellow bars are our longest serving uh, bike counter. The vertical lines are monthly uh, totals, and the red squiggly line is temperature. Uh, so it's just as regular as clockwork. So against that background, we're looking for uh, changes in the signal. And things happen as they happened here last year, 2018. We had tremendously wet year. So 166% normal precipitation is 81 inches of rain in Washington, D.C. That really has a, an effect of suppressing usage. I mean, the, the, the demand is there, but people... Don't take out their nice bikes on rainy weather. Um, so, and in addition, uh, we uh, our 
our contract with EcoCounter Eco lapsed. So we were with, without maintenance service. I couldn't buy batteries. Oops, I need to quiet something here, sorry. And uh, so it was a bit of a double whammy that uh, set us back a little bit yes, last year, which is another reason for the, the 2.0 moniker. Uh, next slide, please. Now, it, a couple of things about some data. So here's a curve of data. Uh, it, it's showing a whole bunch of bike lane counts plus a derived aggregate average. Uh, the, the vertical is volume, the horizontal is months of a year. So what you're seeing is the average usage, the average portion of annual usage per month. So January, February, really low. February, Mar or March, April starts to climb. We have a nice high season from sort of the middle of April to the middle of October. Then it starts to drop off as the weather changes. This constitutes a really characteristic um, pattern for usage across our system, uh, whether it's bike lanes, whether it's trails, whether it's bridges, that sort of fingerprint um, is relatively constant. And this sort of truth about our system, and that's something that Becca mentioned, is that you're, you're capturing the truth of the activity in the network. This really goes a long way. People have never seen this before. They, they think nobody rides in the winter. They don't realize that we've got, you know, still 10% of June's cycling traffic is cycling in January. Um, and that makes a difference. That's, that's helped us win some really important victories. I was impressed by the Longfellow Bridge uh, story. I don't think we have anything quite to match that, but we were able to uh, use this data to argue for vacating a lane of a US highway here, which allowed us to widen one of our main trails. It was a really uh, significant uh, step forward for our uh, infrastructure system. Um, and we've won some money for snow clearing on our main trails, partly on the basis of being able to document that we've got some significant non-trivial wintertime cycling activity. Next slide, please. And just one more shot of that um, fingerprint. So here's that aggregate of the bike lane data from the previous slide now combined with two of our most popular trails. The same sort of overall very high agreement of the uh, monthly activity. Uh, and again, these are just, these are percentages, monthly percentage proportions of an annual total, but the, the, the numerical difference between these sites would be very great. Uh, one of our bike trails gets 4,000 people a day on a summer, and one of our bike lanes might get 400 people. But if you look at the percentage pattern over time, they're very, very similar. Next, lane, next slide, please. Year over year, I sometimes wish we could show these exponential curves that just go off the chart, but what we're seeing is pretty modest growth, like two to 3% increase over, over year over year. And we think this is because we have a fairly mature system here. It's largely based on trails. We're doing more and more things on the streets. We're adding some protected bike lanes, but we sort of have what we have. And knowing that, we went into a recent uh, rewrite of our bicycle master plan and took that understanding into that planning work and pushed for the next generation of infrastructure, which would be more protected bike lanes, more connectivity, more all ages and abilities, more low stress travel routes. So this sort of flat line display looks kind of negative in a way, but it is, again, the truth of our system. The next slide. And it's true whether you look at that first slide, which was all year data, versus this one, which is just high season data, just April through October. So it raises these questions. Are we building the right kind of facilities in the right locations to serve the people, to open up more opportunities? Um, there's a question about scooters. You know, we have uh, we were we were an, 
early recipient of the scooter wave. Um, so we're formalizing the um, relationship with the scooter companies now, but they're largely not picked up by the bike counters. They don't have enough uh, ferrous material in them to trip the metal detectors. They might be picked up by the the uh, infrared pedestrian sensors. So we don't really have a clear sense about the impact of scooters on our on our bike numbers, our bike data. Uh, next slide, please. Another part of managing a system is adapting to change. And five of my 19 permanent locations need to be reinstalled because of uh, construction work to the underlying road, trail, or bridge. And the two pictures on the bottom are Arlington Memorial Bridge, which I mentioned. It's undergoing a major, major reconstruction, $280 million contract, and they're a year and a half into it, and it's gonna go on for another year at least. And I think it's a pretty major win for us to get bicycle uh, pedestrian counting equipment acknowledged by Federal Highways, Park Service as a real benefit to the long-term service of that bridge as we're building it in from the ground up. Uh, next slide, please. And then uh, on the two more thoughts about adapting over time, on the left is the face of our EcoCounter Display Classic, formerly called the Totem. And ours has been in place for five years. And the first version of it had a scale that ran up to 1 million. And uh, running it for four or five years, we realized we're unlikely to reach 1 million. So we're going to have a new set of panels made that scale it at 500,000 as the, as the top limit. If we have to uh, increase it again, we will do that. But um, we're going to move it to a new location. This is on a widened trail that's uh, increased from 8 feet to 16 feet wide. And we're reestablishing the prominence of our uh, real-time data display. The, the two top photos in the center are details about the Memorial Bridge uh, installation. Doing everything we can to make this uh, visually very low impact. This is an extremely important, historically significant bridge. We don't want to have a lot of high-tech gear showing up. So we're going to bury the electronic equipment in the cast iron lamppost. And the center top picture with the little round device is an antenna. The uh, the, the modem in the EcoCounter system can't send a signal out through cast iron. So we're going to actually attach a little puck antenna on the outside of the hatch. Um, the bottom picture is a pre-formed loop that uh, I was installing this morning on the steel uh, reinforcing mesh for the sidewalk. And the upper right photo is a similar uh, installation we did several years ago. In this case, the, the three foot tall steel post contains the electronic devices, but the loops are buried in the concrete and completely invisible. And there's a benefit to this. It just makes it more subtle, more baked into the infrastructure. It's not a big flashy in your face thing. There are places and times for that, but we also just want to be quietly collecting information. Uh, next slide, please. And then there's Amazon. People probably know that uh, Arlington County uh, won, uh, was one of the winners of the competition to host uh, Amazon's new headquarters. It's, uh, they're, they're coming. They're calling uh, rebranding a portion of Arlington and Alexandria as National Landing. Tremendously ambitious plans to rebuild big chunks of city blocks, and they have a very strong, uh, walkable, sustainable bike ped orientation. So we don't know exactly how that's going to play out, but we know that one of the reasons that Arlington was favored in that competition is because we have a long history of doing trans-oriented development. We have a long history of supporting bike and ped mobility, of substituting uh, walk, bike, metro, transit trips from car trips. We're able to absorb new residents and employees without increasing surface uh, single occupant vehicle 
trips. It's a real success story. Arlington has been a real success at that. Um, and we're about to embark on this next chapter. Uh, and then finally, one more slide. This is uh, nearby to the part of Arlington where Amazon is coming. And it's a very ambitious uh, railroad bridge replacement. It's called Long Bridge. It's been around for 100 years. It no longer is uh, adequate to current and projected traffic. So there's a very big deal bridge replacement project coming along. I call it the billion dollar bridge. We haven't really heard the final price tag yet. As part of the environmental review for that project, governments, including Arlington, advocates, all sorts of interest groups spoke up and said, won't you please consider adding a new bicycle pedestrian river crossing as part of this major railroad bridge project. And, and we won. We won it at least as a placeholder in the final uh, EIS that report that has come out. There's no design yet. There's no funding yet. But it was important to win consideration for, for the first time a really designed for purpose bicycle pedestrian bridge across the Potomac. So not just something that's a sidewalk on a major interstate highway, uh, but really uh, a significant separate crossing. It's been called for for years and years in everybody's master planning. This will tie into a park on our side of the river where there will be uh, a major uh, aquatic center with showers and lockers, and there's a major parking lot. So it can be a real trailhead to the regional trail system. So uh, I think this is a nationally significant project, and we're very happy to be in on uh, the uh, ground of that. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. Um, that was a really great presentation. Like I said before, you just have so much knowledge about uh, counting. And it's also so cool to see the way that your count uh, initiatives have evolved, evolved over the years. I think that's really great. Um, so we're running a little behind on time. So I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Um, I would like to introduce Amelia Neptune. Uh, before joining the League of American Bicyclists, Amelia worked for um, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, which is a bicycle-friendly university. And before that, communications for the Nature Conservancy, which is a bicycle-friendly business. Uh, Amelia has a background in environmental sustainability, and her hobbies include teaching her three-year-old daughter how to ride a bike. EcoCounter has been really proud to work with her for the last few years, including uh, working on things like this webinar, webinar which she's co-hosting with us. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Amelia. Thanks so much, Andrea. Um, that's right, you can go ahead to the next slide. Um, so as Andrea said, um, my name is Amelia Neptune. I'm the director of the Bicycle Friendly America program at the League of American Bicyclists. And if you're not familiar with the Bicycle Friendly America program, I'll just give a very quick um, overview. Every other year, we rank all 50 states in the Bicycle Friendly State program. And then we have sort of opt-in programs for communities, businesses, and universities to apply for the designation of Bicycle Friendly from us. And um, there are very thorough um, online applications for each of those programs and um, in addition to evaluating and reviewing uh, communities, businesses, and universities for the designation of, um, of bronze through platinum award levels, we also give out feedback to um, applicants. So whether you get an award or not, and not everybody does get an award, um, you'll get feedback from us on how to improve and become more bicycle friendly. So I'm going to be talking today about how um, data plays a role in these programs and um, specifically in the Bicycle Friendly Community Program. Next slide. So we see a very wide variety of how data is collected in the Bicycle Friendly America program, um, ranging from the automated um, eco-counter totem style 
um, counter to this wonderful mileage chart that I just love sharing as an example from a bakery in Vermont that is a bicycle friendly business and they got all of their employees to just track how many days uh, they, they ride. So um, I share this mostly to say bike counting can be very high tech, um, but it can also be low tech and at the community scale that can mean, you know, recruiting volunteers um, to stand at an intersection and um, count bicyclists. So there's, there's obviously a very wide range range of how data can be collected. Next slide. In the Bicycle Friendly Community application, we have a few uh, different areas where we get into the nitty gritty of how a community is collecting data. This is a um, question under the evaluation and planning section of the application. It's a multiple choice question, just looking for all the different ways a community can collect information on bicycle usage. And we're really interested in, um, you know, seeing communities approach this as holistically as possible. And um, our, our philosophy is that it's, you know, the more data you're collecting, the better. Um, automated counters do a lot to look at um, specific areas, whether they're permanent or mobile, um, portable like Minnesota uses. Um, getting consistent counts through automated counters is really important. Um, getting any kind of quantitative data is really important, but we also look at um, qualitative data and um, information like demographics of writers. There's a lot of different aspects of um, how data can be collected. If you look at the next slide, um, there's sort of a sub question there where after asking all the different ways a community does collect data, we ask them to actually provide us with any data they collect in these um, different categories. So utilitarian ridership, recreational ridership, demographic data, school data, specifically looking at kids um, getting to and from school, and then any other data. Um, and this is where a lot of communities are uploading their wonderful screenshots or reports from their eco-counter data or other tools that they're using. Um, and it, it helps give us uh, extra context for ridership um, in the community. Next slide. In addition to benchmarking ridership, we also want to see communities setting goals for mode share um, and bicycle usage. And so you'll see in the evaluation and planning section, there's a question on setting goals um, and sort of how, how those change over time is, is something we look at for, for returning bicycle friendly communities. Um, and then uh, similar to what some of our presenters today have, have described, we look at how data is being used to conduct pre and post um, evaluations of construction or new um, infrastructure projects. Um, and that's, that's an important component. Next slide. Um, so you may be familiar with this uh, infographic, we call it the building blocks of a bicycle friendly community, showing sort of the averages of um, different uh, key indicators um, within the bicycle friendly community application, both in terms of inputs of, of what the community is doing, but also outcomes, including ridership. Next slide. And so I, I wanted to highlight just that um, data collection, obviously, as I showed earlier, is a big component of the evaluation and planning section of the application. Ridership is another big area. Um, but as I mentioned, engineering is, a, is an area where uh, we want to see some data collection happening with those pre and post construction evaluations. Um, a few other areas that I didn't want to include all the questions, but a few other areas that we ask about data collection include um, bike share. We look at whether data is collected, whether it's shared publicly. Um, we also look at, um, as I mentioned, the demographic data and then qualitative data through surveys, um, travel diaries, that sort of thing. Next slide. Um, every community that applies to the Bicycle Friendly Community Program gets a report card. This is a screenshot of Arlington's report card. Um, next slide. And as you can see on the report card, we include ridership data. Um, now, because every community is currently tracking their ridership in very different ways, um, some communities are tracking it a whole lot like Arlington is and some aren't at all and there's pretty much everything in between. Um, so unfortunately, the only consistent metric we have um, to be able to publish a ridership data, uh, data point for every community that applies to the BFC program is the Census Bureau's uh, American Community, community Survey. Um, next slide. 
So on the Census Bureau's website, you can look up any community and um, the, through their annual ACS survey, um, it's, it's um, possible to get a number of um, bicycle commuters per um, compared to uh, all commuters in that community. Um, this is a pretty flawed number. We'll, we'll be the first to admit that this is not the best way um, to look at um, bike ridership overall for a few different reasons. It only looks at commuting. It also, it asks respondents um, what, they, what mode they used in the last week, what single mode they used most often. So for example, if you ride your bike to um, public transportation and then take the bus or the train the rest of the way, you might answer that you rode the bus. Um, or if it was a particularly rainy week last week and you just happened to not ride, um, but you normally do the rest of the year, um, that, that data might not be captured accurately. Um, so for a lot of reasons, it's it's not a perfect number, but uh, as, I, as I often say, it's um, flawed consistently across the country. Um, uh, next slide. It also, because it's consistent, it allows us to not only to look at all bicycle-friendly community applicants using the same methodology, um, it also allows us to do uh, national reporting of ridership in a consistent way. So this is our most recent Where We Ride report, which we um, usually publish every fall when new ACS data gets published by the Census Bureau. Um, and you can find that on our website if you just Google um, Bike League Where We Ride report. Um, you'll probably find the most recent one. And um, if you don't, feel free to reach out to me and I can send you the link. Next slide. Um, and then, as I said, it, it helps us to at least look at things consistently across the country and over time. Um, so uh, despite its flaws, it, it is still a very useful tool for us in terms of um, tracking ridership across the country. Next slide. As a very quick case study, um, oops, sorry, the fonts came out a little messy here. Um, the Villages Florida is a gold level bicycle friendly community um, that has according to ACS data, very low ridership, 0.39%. Um, um, so uh, you, you might be asking yourself, how could a community with that low commuter ridership be a gold level BFC? Um, well, this is a very unique community. It's, it's sort of a retirement community. Um, there are more golf carts than cars in the community. Um, there are, I think, uh, a few hundred different bike clubs in the community. So there's a whole lot of bicycle ridership, but not very much commuting going on, um, and certainly not much um, bike commuting going on, um, just because it's uh, the, of the unique nature of the community. Next slide. So when we were evaluating them, they were a silver level bicycle friendly community reapplying, hoping to move up to gold, and they were able to provide us with um, a lot of data that they had collected at the community level to show that ridership was in fact very high, even though their ACS numbers were gonna be low. They knew to expect that we would see low numbers there. Um, so any bicycle friendly community, especially as you're moving up to the higher award levels, um, we strongly encourage data collection um, to help our review team understand ridership in your community, but also obviously for the community itself to understand. And as you heard in the previous three presentations, it's really critical, um, you know, especially when you're looking at specific infrastructure projects, uh, but also at a community wide scale and certainly from an advocacy standpoint, as Becca said, being able to prove that ridership exists or demand exists um, is a really useful tool. Um, next slide. So one other thing I'll mention for the bicycle friendly community application process is we do a public survey and um, we've been doing this since 2016. Before that we had a um, slightly different public input process but we've opened it up to be a, a pretty robust public input process now um, and the survey questions actually track the National Household Travel Survey questions, which is a, a survey done by NHTSA every 10 years. So we have national data to compare our BFC applicant communities uh, data to, and we're also able to compare each community to the average of different award levels. Um, we've now gotten over 40,000 responses since we started doing this survey um, for all of our bicycle-friendly community applications over the last few years. Um, and we're seeing some really interesting things. So here's the question. Um, 
respondents who said they live within a quarter mile of a marked bike lane and you can see the difference of um, applicants that got an award versus who didn't get an award versus sort of the average um, of all surveys and the NHTSA survey. Um, next slide. And then we're also uh, able to break down questions by award level. Um, so uh, is it safe or dangerous to ride a bicycle in your neighborhood? Platinum is on the far left and no award is on the far right. And you can see sort of how, how that question, um, how that response varies um, according to um, award level. Uh, next slide. And then there's a follow-up question to that one on our survey of if you answered dangerous or it depends, what are the reasons um, that you feel it's not safe to ride in your neighborhood? Um, and a really interesting thing that we noticed is that as you move up in award levels, the question, the, the, the answer to that question starts to be more about driver behavior and traffic patterns and less about infrastructure. In the lower award level communities, it's more about infrastructure. Um, so that was just interesting for us to see and I we strongly encourage communities to do their own surveys and to collect some qualitative data in addition to their quantitative data um, questions like uh, you know would you feel comfortable riding next to someone and having a conversation with another bicyclist in this bike lane um, those are questions that are actually posed in um, Copenhagen's um, bicycle report so it, it's um, there's a lot of different ways to collect data and we encourage, um, you know, as I said, as much as possible. Um, next slide. So if you're not already involved in the Bicycle Friendly Community Program, I just wanted to put a plug in for it. The next application deadline is February 5th. Um, and here are some links to learn more. And with that, I'll hand it back to the folks at EcoCounter. Thanks so much, Amelia. Uh, that was a really great presentation and thorough overview of um, the bike friendly community program. I think it's really interesting how many different types of data, um, qualitative and quantitative that you bring together. Um, so moving on, I would like to introduce EcoCounter's very own Matt Ainsley. Um, as an avid cyclist himself, Matt's passionate about using data to improve cycling in communities across North America. He spearheads this partnership with the League of American Bicyclists here at EcoCounter. And he generally works to help organization use count data as effectively and powerfully as possible. So Matt, I'm going to hand it over to you. And just an FYI, we are running a little bit over time. Thank you very much, Andrea. And thank you to everyone who's spoken here already today. Those are some tough acts to, to follow, but I will see what I can do. And yeah, in the spirit of us running a little bit late, maybe I'll do a slightly abridged version of what I plan to do before. So uh, talking about make it count data for bike planning. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about our part, the EcoCounter's partnership with uh, the League and Bike Friendly Communities. And then also a bit about a survey that we did last year with the Bike Friendly Community Program and how EcoCounter has responded to that and a couple of projects that we've done in response to that. So next slide, please. So yeah, as, as has already been mentioned today, we've worked with uh, with the Bike Friendly Community Program for a couple of years now. And for us, this is a super important partnership and, and really something that's very fruitful. It really allows us to keep our ear to the ground in terms of what bike friendly communities and aspiring bike friendly communities need. You know, there's been a lot of talk about the importance of data today for bike friendly communities and for bike planning. But mostly it really allows us to understand how those needs are changing. Uh, we live in a time where the needs of communities are changing every week, every month, every year. And we want to be able to respond to those needs and ensure that bike friendly communities and aspiring bike friendly communities have the exact tools that they need to progress up the medallion chart. So next slide, please. Um, so, I think it's been covered cl quite clearly today that the, the importance of collecting bike count data. Michael and David have uh, really given a good overview of this, so I'll move forward. So, so we know that it is really important for bike friendly communities to collect their uh, to collect count data, and I think this chart is slightly out of date, but we know that that the more data you collect, the more likely you are to have bike-friendly community certification. 100% of bike-friendly communities with gold certification work with EcoCounter. 
30% of bronze friendly communities work with EcoCounter and 77% of silver work with EcoCounter too. So we know, and as Amelia has already mentioned, data and count data is super important for bike friendly communities. Next slide, please. So, so last year we undertook a survey in collaboration with the Bike Friendly Community Program to understand the state of bicycle counting in 2018. We know that bike counting has been around for a long time now. Uh, in David's presentation, for example, he talked about the fact that Arlington has been collecting count data for 10 years. And we want to ensure that we have the tools for someone like David, for example, who's been collecting 10 year, data for 10 years to be able to add, have the tools that he needs, but then also communities that are just starting developing infrastructure or just starting to count, make sure that they have the right tools too. So all across the spectrum. We received responses from 178 uh, different communities representing 42 states, and 80% of those communities uh, already collect bike count data. Quite interestingly, 75% also collect another type of, of bike data, we broke it down into what we call the bike count data. So that is volumes, volumes at a particular site. And then bike activity data, which encompasses things like qualitative data, encompasses things like uh, maybe bike share data, maybe origin destination data, GPS data, things like that. Next slide, please. So I'm going to focus in on a couple of uh, key takeaways for us. And the first is regard to data satisfaction and resource capacity. We found that only 29% of communities uh, that count, that collect count data, report having sufficient or mostly sufficient data. And 41% of respondents with automated counters are generally satisfied with their data versus 21% who, uh, who are satisfied who just do manual counting. And I should also note that one in four communities who responded to the survey uh, only collect manual count data. Next slide, please. And for, I think, everyone out there, you won't be surprised at the next takeaway for us that time and money are the biggest barriers. Funding time, staff time, and technological tools are the biggest barriers to progressing account program. And, and something else that we weren't so surprised about, that small organizations are most likely not to have the budget for bicycle counting. And for us, what this really hammered home is the need for to do more with less, to be able to answer those pressing uh, bike planning questions with the, res with the limited amount of resources, time, money, tools that we have. Next slide, please. And so e at EcoCounter, we also undertake our own studies and uh, we are constantly doing research and development and testing on our products. And we aim to do that in a way that sort of answers questions in our home neighborhood too. So in, a, in addition to ensuring that the, the counters are accurate, we like to ensure that we are able, also able to use them in a way that the cities that we work with also use them. So that is creating methodologies, creating replicable methodologies that we can share with the cities that we work with. So last summer, we undertook quite an extensive study in our home neighborhood in the city of Montreal. And we wanted to look at how do people move through the neighborhood to see if we could use our tools in a easy replicable way to capture the mode share of the neighborhood that we work and live in. Next slide, please. So this involved in a cordon count, uh, also known as a screen line count on 19 streets across the Plateau Mount Royal neighborhood. That is the neighborhood that we live in. Uh, two weeks counting on each street for two weeks at a time and counting the number of bicycles, pedestrians, uh, and vehicles on each street for two weeks at a time. And then using data extrapolation factors to extrapolate those short-term counts. The short-term counts were done with tube counters and Pyrobux short-term counters and extrapolate them using nearby permanent counters to capture AADT, uh, so annual estimates of traffic. Next slide, please. And so here is our screen line across 19 streets in the neighborhood. And this is a really important transit corridor. It goes from residential neighborhoods in the north to our downtown uh, in the bottom right picture of what you can see, which is like southeast of what you see. Next slide, please. 
and move on. Next slide, please. So from here, we did seasonal estimates. And from each two-week count, estimated essentially a quick and dirty mochair split of this neighborhood. Um, from the estimation, and that is a model that we built in-house uh, in collaboration with McGill University and published in TRB, uh, those extrapolation estimated 21 million passes through the model, of which 2.5 million were bike passes, 11 were vehicle passes, and six were pedestrian passes finding that t bikes make up 12% of traffic in the neighborhood, pedestrians 32% and vehicles 56%. And quite interestingly, next slide please, we found that on the majority of streets in the neighborhood, bike and bikes and pedestrians constitute the majority of street users. So we broke it down to a street by street level and looked at the mode share split on each different street and found that vehicles primarily the highest volume of traffic of vehicles was on the arterial north-south streets, whereas on the rest of the streets, bicycles and pedestrians made up the majority of traffic. Next slide, please. On one street, for example, on Clark Street, which is just two streets over from the Eco Counter office in Montreal, um, pedestrians made up three times the number of uh, street users than vehicles on one street, and cyclists about two times as much. Next slide, please. So then, then we brought in another layer, uh, a layer of, uh, uh, brought in another type of data to layer it on top of these count data that we've already collected. We use Google Maps and other GIS software to, to measure the physical space allocated to each mode on the street. On, this is a north-south arterial with a on-street painted bike lane, you can see in the right of the photo. Two lines, two lanes of car traffic and two lanes of parked car traffic, and then measure the physical space allocated to each mode to the actual mode share on that street. And you can imagine the sort of interesting comparisons we were able to make from, from, from those two data points. Next slide, please. Looking again at this, uh, at Clark Street, the one I just mentioned, uh, despite accounting for 49% of the mode share on the street, pedestrians are allocated just 30% of the physical street space. Vehicles accounted for 19% of the mode share traffic, yet when combined with the, the street lane and the parking, would allocated 70% of the, of the road space. And so the, the point is that we aim to do more with a small amount of data and a small amount of tools. Just with a couple of tube counters and a couple of power box counters, we were able to capture the mode share across once across a whole neighborhood throughout the summer. Next slide, please. And so by being a bit more uh, resourceful with the tools that we have, and by being more question oriented, we were able to get a lot from just a small study. And so taking this report that we created, we picked out a couple of key facts and a couple of key statistics and passed them along to some city councillors who are pro-cycling and pass them along to some bike advocates here in Montreal in order to have them push these messages and in order to have them use this data to, to uh, promote cycling in the neighbourhood and in order to bring in the question of equity with regards to how our streets are planned. Next slide, please and created this as a poster that was presented at APBP. If, uh, if anyone in the audience was at APBP last month, you might have met my colleague Olivia who presented this at APBP last month. And it's something that we're very proud of and very proud to have been part of in collaboration with the city of Montreal. Next slide. And again, and I think I will leave it at that for the moment. My next case study talks about uh, how we layer crash data and crash statistics onto EcoCounter automated count data in order to capture uh, crash exposure and crash accident exposure. The full report, in addition to the full report of the project I just mentioned, is available in the handout section of the webinar. And please feel free to contact me if you have any questions about that, and I'd love to discuss it further. Thank you very much.
All right. Uh, thank you so Matt, much, Matt. Uh, great presentation. Uh, before we move on to the question and answer period, um, I just wanted to take a moment to thank all of our speakers today for participating. Those are some really interesting and nuanced presentations from a variety of different perspectives. Um, and I think there's a lot to take away from them. Um, I really hope that the audience has enjoyed uh, sitting in and participating. Thank you so much to everyone who's attended. Um, and in uh, an effort to save some time, I think I'm going to move on to the question period now, which um, Amelia from the League is going to moderate. So I'll hand it over to Amelia. Great, thank you, Andrea. Um, if folks have questions, feel free to type them into the chat, the question box. Um, we definitely won't have time to answer all of them right now because we already have a lot, but we can reply via email. Um, the GoToWebinar is telling me who who's asking, so we're, we'll be able to follow up via email if we can't get to your question. Um, so I will start. I think this is going to be a question mostly for the folks at Eagle Counter, but other speakers feel free to chime in. Um, two similar questions. One person asked, "Are there?" any counters that can count bikes, peds, and motor vehicles on shared streets where all modes use the same travel lane? And I assume as part of that, um, uh, differentiate between the modes. And another person asked a similar question, um, how are any of the presenters collecting data in shared lanes and bike lanes? This is the most difficult data to collect for us in Michigan at the present time. Um, so uh, Matt or Andrea, I don't know if you guys want to start off with that. Sure. Yeah. I yeah. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, I Matt. I can provide the uh, technical eco counter perspective, and then maybe some of the practitioners could give their perspective. Um, eco counter has a counter available that is able to count bikes, pedestrians, and vehicles on the same street or at an intersection, for example. It is called the Citix 3D counter. It's a camera counter a, that does not record video but processes the counts and differentiations in real time. Uh, we didn't have this counter. It's a brand new for us and we didn't have it available when we did the study last summer. So we would love to replicate this exact sort of study, a mode share study on using this type of counter. Uh, yeah, but maybe other practitioners have different perspectives. This, this is Michael from Minnesota. Um, in the past, uh, we've We've used metro count devices for a couple shared facilities or trying to get uh, autom automobile and bike counts uh, in the same corridor. And we found that um, the Boulder County actually in Colorado actually developed a specific um, schema for um, characterizing the the hits on the tubes. So it's a tube specific counter that we used and it did a pretty good job of, um, and pretty reliably, I think it was like a 70 to 90% um, accuracy rate for separating out uh, motor vehicles and bikes. So that's what we had done in the past. And um, at this point in time, yeah, aside from video, we don't have something that that uh, uh, really works um, better. This is David Patton in Arlington. Uh, we have a similar history of, to what Michael just mentioned, using a metro count tube counter and the Boulder, Colorado uh, technique. And we applied it to that fingerprint of data, the annual data that I used. Uh, to extrapolate out to estimate annual volumes on a prospective bike route uh, corridor. Great, thank you all. Um, specific question for Michael and then a general question. I'm again gonna combine two um, that I think are similar. Um, so for Michael, in the state of Minnesota, how have you gotten local governments to latch on to the loan program? Um, and are they only two counters or is there a camera as well as a sort of sub question for that? And then a general question that I think is similar. Um, someone said, as Matt mentioned, small orgs and budgets are a problem. Does anyone have suggestions on how to come over, overcome this um, or justify the expense? 
Yeah, great question. Um, so how have we gotten partners to be interested in this? Um, we didn't really publicize it very well <laughs> initially when we started the program. We doled out the equipment to um, interested parties. Most of it is hosted at our district offices, but in some cases the office that the MnDOT office in our district is not very centrally located, so we have hosted it at a couple other, uh, they're all um, local planning organizations for the region that they're in. And so with them, um, they all had very local contacts and other contacts that we at a state DOT didn't necessarily have, so um, they were able to get out the word amongst their cohorts uh, on their own. And then we also have a strong partnership at the state level with our Department of Health. And so the local um, community health partners and uh, ship coordinators have really, have, have really been the drivers for using the portable equipment uh, in a lot of different areas around the state. Um, so it hasn't been as coordinated or publicized as an, um, as a as publicized as much as I would like it to be, um, but then again, we've um, we've pretty much been operating just with myself and working across the entire state, trying to uh, continually spread the word. And it's growing slowly, but um, uh, we we could do better. Oh, and uh, and we don't have any cameras that we loan out specifically. It is the equipment kits consist of one. Uh, Eagle counter pyro box, so an infrared counter that counts both bikes and peds just as a total number, and then a two one tube counter per equipment kit. So there's two counters per kit, and there's eight of those around the state. Thanks, Michael. And does anyone have anything to add to the question of um, justifying the expense or, or staff and time in doing counts? If not, I'll say this presentation. <laughs> um, and the um, the league is definitely um, hoping to help uh, communities justify it um, with tools like the the report from EcoCounter, um, uh, showing you know the more bicycle friendly communities um, doing counts and how it's been used. Um, I'd also say that we've uh, tried to focus some sessions at the National Bike Summit on. Um, data collection and um, it's since it takes place in Arlington now we actually even include mobile workshops showing off those um, those counters in in the wild um, so getting getting some decision makers to attend and um, see the value um, could be one one tactic um, Amelia I, I'll jump in this is Michael again um, I, we have found that the portable counter program and loaning the counters out has been kind of a, a in for some of our communities and for some of the the frequent lenders has kind of been a gateway drug for them and hey they've learned how to use the equipment they've learned how impactful data can be and have then uh, identified funds within their um, annual budget or put it into plans and documents so that uh, biking and walking data is considered in the future and therefore in order to get data you have to have some sort of counting program or some sort of means of counting. We also have been operating a man like manual counts all over the state. Um, hundreds of community communities within the state have done uh, manual counts and um, I'm working on coalescing all that information and putting it together so that we can attach it to a, a web map of all the sites that we've counted at as well. It's in the works, um, but the manual counting has also been useful in uh, not only um, building interest in automated counting equipment because it, it can look at data for a longer period of time or collect data for a longer period of time, but it also builds um, advocacy and interest within the community too and people that are manually counting and tallying for two to four hours at a time um, 
where at a location where they typically drive through and never see anyone, it really opens their eyes when they end up with 25, 50, 150 tallies at the end of their shift. So um, it, it makes a big difference. This is David Patton again. Just I will tag on to what Michael said. Uh, I wouldn't have come up with the idea of calling this a gateway drug, but it it does serve like that. And I'm finding that's the case among my colleagues who are down the hall in the building where I work, who are transportation engineers. And I'm getting more and more requests for uh, using our portable automatic continuous equipment where they're proposing projects. So we can put a counter out for a week or 10 days and get numbers that they would have to hire a contractor for thousands of dollars to collect. So, uh, oops, sorry. Thank you. I think we might have just lost David. Um, Andrea, are you still there? Yes, hi, I'm still here. Okay, <laughs> great. I think uh, our attendees are still on. So um, I wanted to acknowledge that we're five minutes past uh, when the webinar was supposed to end. So thank you to everyone who's still on. Um, I'm. If the speakers are okay, I'm fine taking another five minutes or so to answer questions. But attendees, if you need to drop off, um, feel free. And as I said, if you asked a question that we didn't get to, um, we will also email you. Um, so speakers, do you mind if I just throw out a couple more? No, no, um, no, but no. actually, um, if, if we're continuing, uh, I have one additional thing to add on the last point. Um, as an advocate, if any of you are in a city or state agency, turn to your local advocates. You know, if it's advocating for more of a budget isn't something you can do internally, we often collaborate and, you know, when we see a need, we'll advocate and, and the city and state folks are often grateful that we're asking for money for things like count program. So, you know, use them. Also, the first eco counter um, that we had in the region was in Cambridge, and our advocacy organization worked with the city of Cambridge to help secure grant funding. Um, and obviously, um, private sources aren't ideal, um, but it was a great way to get the first totem in the region, um, and the funder actually paid for that data to be publicly available um, on that website as well. So a couple other ideas. Awesome, thank you so much, Becca, that's great. Mm -hmm. um, so another uh, attendee has asked, what's the value of social media derived counts such as Strava? Um, and I can start out by saying Strava has a tool called Strava Metro, um, where they're, they are able to share some of their data with communities that, um, it's interesting because it, it does allow you to look at um, things like demographic data since it's you know pulling straight from people's smartphones it knows exactly who is writing um, it's also able to look at um, pretty much any anywhere that person is writing if they turned on the app um, so there doesn't need to be a physical counter um, but obviously the limitation is it relies on people using the app. Um, so, you know, there are some equity concerns of, you know, only counting people with smartphones in their pockets. Um, and then, you know, just the accessibility of um, people having to opt in in order to be counted. Um, so I think there are some pros and cons to it, certainly. Um, but I think there's definitely a role for it to supplement something like the automated counters. Um, and data collection through a tool like EcoCounter. Um, so I'll be curious if anybody else, um, Becca or Michael, if you guys have experience working with um, that type of data collection. Um, yeah, so this is Michael. <laughs> uh, in terms of Strava specifically, so in Minnesota we have not used uh, at, at least at the state level, we have not used Strava data. Uh, I have used periodically um, what uh, was mentioned was the the metro map or their data set which provides heat maps of general areas where people like to bike and walk and run. Uh, that has been useful in a, a few local um iteration or projects, but it's, yeah, again, there's um, there's always issues with how the data is collected and who it represents. Um, we at the state are also looking into streetlight information 
and that is collected with, uh, well, the data that is going into that is GPS information from um, new cars and trucks and other things that are already GPS equipped, um, GPS units in, uh, in phones con consistently pinging whether the phone is using an app or not. And so we are able to use that to pretty fairly high degree of accuracy for um, motor vehicles and their movements. But because of volumes being um, quite a bit smaller in magnitude for people biking and walking, it hasn't been as the, the uses haven't been as apparent or helpful for the biking and walking data at this point in time. I know that they are working on adding, the company Streetlight is working on adding more and more uh, bicycle and pedestrian data to their data set. Um, but there's also efforts. Uh, I see Josh Roll is one of the attendees and others at um, Oregon State and within their state DOT too. And other partners around the country are working on um, fusion reports and research to try and combine a lot of different sources of data into one usable format. So keep an eye on Keep an eye out for some of those um, research projects. And yeah, I am looking forward to learning with all of you as well. Yeah, and I'll say um, I don't unfortunately have any additional information or ideas on automated um, places to, to get good data, but we typically try not to rely on or advocate for the use of Strava data, and Michael touched on this briefly, just based on who has access and, and who that data represents. We feel, you know, it's not fully really representative of all the people biking in the city. Did Hi, we... Amelia. Is oh, it possible oh, you're oh. muted? There, yes. Sorry. It, the webinar wasn't letting me unmute myself. Um, all right. So I, uh, we, one more question I um, will will throw out if folks are willing um, is there was a comment that several speakers mentioned using a variety of technologies and methods to collect data. Do our EcoCounter data web uh, allow us to upload data from other devices or sources? Um, instead of maintaining multiple database um, databases. So just as I thought that was a good follow up to the previous question. Um, yeah, I'm happy to field this one. Uh, this is a common question that we get from clients. Um, we do highly encourage uh, integrating different data sources. Um, I'd say probably the most common way that people do this is through access to our API. So they can uh, bring the data from their eco counters to another platform. And then if it's something a little, uh, a little simpler, you can actually just download your eco counter data in an Excel file. So in some cases you can kind of crack the nut that way too. Um, yeah, if someone has a specific question about this, I would be, uh, happy to provide some more information and I don't know if anyone else on the panel has uh, experience with this, but feel free to chime in. This is Michael from Minnesota. I don't have any experience specifically with it. Uh, I have heard that you can know, so um, I, that is good to know. We are hoping to set up uh, an API shortly, so Really, look, really looking forward to that consistent stream of data. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. All right, I feel like we should stop there um, just because we've uh, gone 15 minutes over time now. Um, but thank you to the 70 attendees who are still on the call. <laughs> it's clearly a, um, a topic of a lot of interest for a lot of different folks and um, tells me we can do more webinars on bike counts and <laughs> um, keep talking about these issues. So on behalf of the League of American Bicyclists, I really want to thank EcoCounter for your support of the Bicycle Friendly Community Program and, and um, partnership in webinars like this and the research that you, we've done together. Um, and thank you to all of our speakers for presenting um, I'll hand it back to you, Andrea, for any closing remarks. 
Thank you so much, Amelia. Um, uh, rather than keep people much longer, I just want to extend a thank you again to all of our speakers, everyone in attendance, and again also to you, Amelia, um, for helping us organize and also hosting the Q&A. I hope everyone found this to be uh, informative. Uh, have a great day, everyone. Thanks again for showing up. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks. Thank you, everybody.